Hello everyone and welcome back for more biotechnology. Uh, we are going to finish up our discussion on chapter 5 which has been focusing on proteins by having a conversation about using gel electrophoresis to study proteins. Now this conversation is going to be fairly similar to the conversation that we had at the end of chapter 4 when we were talking about using gel electrophoresis to study DNA but with some important differences which we will point out as we go along here. So like I said studying proteins is going to present kind of similar challenges to what we saw with studying DNA. There's going to be some similarities here, notably two of them. First and foremost, proteins are going to be basically invisible to your eyes. So proteins are colorless and they're way too small to see even with a microscope. That's the same sort of problem that we ran into with DNA molecules. And then number two, proteins come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes, which is going to make studying them and distinguishing one protein from another, it's going to make it a little bit challenging. Doesn't mean that we can't get around that, but it's something that we definitely need to consider here. So thankfully, because proteins and nucleic acids seem to kind of share these challenges in common with each other, we can use the basically the same technique to study proteins the same way that we did DNA molecules. So we can separate proteins based on their size by using gel electrophoresis. But here is where we're uh, presented with one important difference. You'll recall that all DNA molecules and all RNA molecules have a net negative charge. So, if we run DNA and RNA through an agarose gel, we can count on all the DNA and RNA molecules migrating in the same direction. They would all migrate towards the red positive electrode. So that's not the case with proteins. So proteins are not necessarily all negatively charged. They can be negatively charged, but by the same token, they can also be positively charged. Or you can find proteins that have no net electrical charge whatsoever. So if you're trying to predict the migration of a protein through a gel by using electrophoresis, you would need to know the net charge of each particular protein. So this is just going to be naturally a little bit different than what we saw with DNA and RNA in which, in which each molecule did have a net negative charge. Another important difference is that when we are uh, separating proteins through gel electrophoresis, we're not really going to be able to use agarose like we did with DNA and RNA. So agarose is kind of a poor choice here because proteins as it would have it are actually going to be quite a bit smaller than DNA and uh, a lot of RNA molecules. So even at very high concentrations of agarose in which there is a great impediment to the migration of even smaller DNA molecules, proteins are really usually going to be even smaller than that so they'll still pass through fairly easily. So if we try to use agarose as our uh, uh, base for making a gel, we're not going to separate the, DNA, uh, the proteins very well and they're going to run out way too quickly. So instead we are going to use a different polymeric base called polyacrylamide. So polyacrylamide is going to make a much tighter and much smaller fit gel so that the proteins will uh, separate from each other fairly well. And then another interesting difference is that whereas agarose gels are run horizontally, which you already got to see in lab, uh, what's called PAGE gels, which stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, these gels are run vertically. So you can actually see a technician loading one here, and it's a little hard to see because uh, a lot of the gel is covered up by a uh, buffer that is kind of halfway filling up that reservoir there. You can actually see the gel that is actually stacked up vertically, and the gel will actually be run that way as well. But other similarities are present, so you are going to load your sample into wells that are pre-loaded there, and then you are going to hook up the gel to a power supply and run a current through it, allowing the proteins to migrate to whichever electrode they uh, are going to go to. More on that in just a little bit. All right, so 
the conundrum we need to solve here is what we just talked about, right? So proteins can either be negative, positive, or neutral. That is a big problem that we need to kind of figure out here. So isn't that going to cause us problems regardless of kind of how we're orienting the gel and how we're running the gel, regardless of whether it's horizontal or vertical? So the idea is that the negative proteins will migrate to the red anode and the positive proteins will migrate to the black cathode. And then uh, the third thing we can say is that any proteins that have no electrical charge whatsoever, they're not going to migrate at all. The proteins have to have some type of electrical charge if they're going to move with or against the current. So here's how we're going to solve this problem. In most cases of polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, not all, but in most cases, before you actually load your protein samples, the protein is treated with a detergent called sodium dodecyl sulfate, or SDS. So SDS is an anionic detergent, meaning that naturally the detergent molecule has a net negative charge. Now, SDS molecules like very much to bind to proteins and to unfurl them in the process. So you can look in this little diagram here how a protein before being treated with SDS has a variety of different positive and negative charges uh, according to which acidic and basic side chains are a part of the protein structure. But after treating with SDS, we denature the protein, we unfurl it and cause it to lose its shape and everything else, and we coat the entire protein with negative charges. So after this treatment, instead of having a mixture of some proteins that are negative, some proteins that are positive, and some proteins that are neither, now every protein in the mixture is strongly negatively charged. And because they have been unfurled and denatured, all the proteins also have the same shape. So now that we have done this, this SDS treatment, the only thing that makes one protein different from another is how many amino acids are incorporated, meaning how big is the protein. And if we run these samples of proteins after the SDS treatment, we ensure that once we do the gel electrophoresis, we are only going to separate proteins according to their size. So this represents the most common form of polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, and it is called SDS PAGE, or sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So now that we accept that the proteins treated with SDS are going to migrate according to how big they are, the smallest proteins will move the fastest and the biggest proteins will move the slowest, we can talk about changing the concentration of polyacrylamide the same way we did with agarose. If in agarose gel electrophoresis, if you knew that you had DNA molecules that are very small, you probably wanted a higher percentage gel to slow down the rapid migration of those very small DNA molecules. Well, the same thing applies with proteins. So the concentration of polyacrylamide can be changed depending on the expected size of the proteins of interest and how well you want them separated from each other. So the leftmost gel and the gel in the middle, the only difference between them is the percentage of that gel that is made up of polyacrylamide. On the left we have an 8% gel and on, uh, in the middle we have an 18% gel. You'll notice the leftmost gel being a lower percentage of polyacrylamide uh, makes for much better separation between all of the proteins that are loaded in, whereas a higher percentage gel slows down the migration of even the smaller proteins and causes the bands to migrate much closer together. Now, what percentage of polyacrylamide you end up using, that's just going to depend on what kinds of proteins you're running out and which ones you actually want to see and which ones you can live with running out the bottom of the gel. The one on the far right is what's called a, a gradient gel. So it says 6 to 18% because uh, the percentage of polyacrylamide varies as you go from the top to the bottom of the gel. So at the top of the gel, you have 6% polyacrylamide, and then as you go from top to bottom, the polyacrylamide content increases. 
this is an ideal type of gel to run if you are interested in all kinds of proteins and all kinds of sizes. So you kind of get the best of both wor worlds. The larger proteins in the lower percentage at the top should segregate from each other fairly well, and the smaller proteins at the bottom should uh, slow down the closer they get to the bottom so you don't r necessarily run the risk of them running out the bottom of the gel and being lost. Now, something for us to discuss in interpreting SDS page gels. You're probably noticing in this picture here that each band, which represents each unique individual protein that is run out in the gel, has a number associated with it. So you're seeing 250 KDA, 98 KDA, 64 KDA. So we need to address what exactly that means. Now, we already know that the size of a protein is totally based on the uh, number of amino acids that it contains. So, this is going to be just a little bit different than what we saw with DNA molecules. Each nucleotide, for the most part, weighed about the same. Now, the size of a protein isn't necessarily going to, it, it is, in a way, it is going to be based on the number of amino acids, but you can't necessarily just use the number of amino acids to predict uh, the size of the protein, because each amino acid weighs a little bit different. Some amino acids are fairly heavy, some amino acids are fairly light. So the average amino acid weighs about 110 grams per mole. Another way of saying that is that it weighs 110 Daltons, which is kind of the standard unit of uh, mass of an atom or a molecule. So if a protein contains 100 amino acids, then just playing the law of averages, it's probably going to have a molecular weight of about 11 kilodaltons, or 11,000 daltons. 11 times 100 would be 11,000, correct? So the protein myosin that you see here, which is visible at the top of the SDS page gel, uh, because its uh, migration in the gel is about 250 kilodaltons, that probably indicates that that protein has well over 2,000 amino acids, which all seems to make sense there. It's a very large protein, so it doesn't migrate very far in the gel. And then finally, another major, major, major similarity between DNA and uh, protein gels is that you have to stain the gel in order to make the molecules visible. We had to stain an agarose gel with something like ethidium bromide in order to visualize the DNA bands. Similarly, the SDS page gel has to be stained in order to make the proteins visible. Uh, there are two common ways that you can do this. On the left, you can see an agarose gel after it has been run out that has been stained with a dye called Kumasi Brilliant Blue. Kumasi is a blue dye that binds to all proteins and it causes the protein bands to become visible after a staining and destaining procedure. On the right, you see an alternative method, which is much, much, much more sensitive, but a lot more of a pain in the rear to do, and that's called silver staining. You'll notice the silver staining is showing much clearer, much, cr much crisper, and much uh, more sensitive types of bands, but like I said, that's only the type of labor-intensive process you would want to put yourself through if you know you're dealing with a protein that is not in very high concentration. You want the more sensitive technique in those cases. So staining a gel is actually not the only thing that you can do after running uh, SDS page. So SDS page actually will typically serve as the first step in a technique that we're going to discuss in the next chapter called Western blotting. So Western blotting is a way of visualizing and identifying individual proteins within a gel rather than just looking at all the proteins that are loaded in that particular lane. So in the gel on the left, which was stained with Kumasi, you're seeing individual bands probably because the samples that were run out were the result of some type of protein purification, whether it's column chromatography or something else. You're not seeing a lot of individual proteins in that gel because there was some type of purification step.
without purification, you would see a whole bunch of bands stacked in each lane. So what Western blotting is going to allow us to do is in a mixture of thousands and hundreds of thousands of different proteins, we can identify just one or a couple by using that technique. So we will definitely uh, get into discussing that in the next chapter. All right, so that is going to do it for chapter five, an introduction to proteins and the study of proteins. So we're gonna have a lot more to say about proteins in subsequent chapters, but this chapter should have served as a nice introduction into the subject matter. So I thank you for your attention and I will see you back here in chapter six. Bye.